Hare Krishna. It's wonderful to be back here once again. And I'll speak today on the topic of Uddhava's devotion for Krishna. And especially I'll talk about this in three parts. One is, I'll talk about the significance of Uddhava in Krishna Rila. Then the significance of Uddhava in the overall narrative of the Bhagavatam. And lastly, we talk about how Uddhava, what we can learn from Uddhava's example in our practice of Bhakti. So now Krishna Leela in the Bhagavatam comes primarily in the 10th and the 11th cantos. Actually 10th canto is mostly Krishna Leela and 11th canto is we can say Krishna Shiksha. Like Krishna speaks the Uddhava Gita. And Uddhava is a very special character in the Bhagavatam because he signifies the connection between Mathura, Dwarka and Vrindav. And in the Gopal Champu, which is an elaboration of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam done by Sri Jiva Goswami, there he describes how when Krishna came from Vrindavan to Mathura, among the first Mathura Vasis with whom he bonded naturally, was Uddhav. The natural friendship developed among them. And then Krishna realized that he had full intention of going back uh, to Vrindavan as soon as Kamsa was killed. But the Yadus told him, you have to stay to protect us. And he couldn't say no to them. So then he, he thought that, okay, there are some demons to be killed and I'll kill them and I'll go back. But, you know, it's like sometimes we think a project will take six months and then it goes on for six years. So, <laughs> so for Krishna also, <laughs> the project of the killing the demons kept expanding, kept expanding. And then he realized that, hey, this is, this is not getting over. So then he thought that, he knew the Vrajavasis would be traumatized by separation from him. And so there are different kinds of disappointments in life. There is some disappointment which is a hopeless disappointment. That means something has gone wrong and it can never be fixed. But when there is hopeful disappointment, that means say if somebody has in an accident been blinded and then the doctors say that maybe you can, you know, you'll do this treatment and your eyes will come back. And they do the treatment and the eyes don't come back. Say, so, no, we'll try this treatment also. I met one devotee in America. He has got severe migraines. He told me he has tried 685 treatments till now. And still, he is known as the sickness acharya of our movement. He is a serious senior Prabhupada disciple, guru and sannyasi. So, it was, so it's like, if you have some disease and it's not going to be cured, then just learn to live with it. But if we have hope it will be cured and then the hope rises and the hope shatters. It's even more painful. So for the Vrajavasis it was like that. Because Krishna had said I will come back. So they are hoping Krishna will come back. And Krishna was not coming back. So then what to do? Krishna was as afflicted by separation from the Vrajavasis as the Vrajavasis were afflicted in separation from Krishna. And at that time, Krishna chose one particular person to go as his representative. Who was that? Uddhava. Now there is a loving tension that Gopal Champu depicts between the Mathuravasis and the Vrajavasis. And the Mathuravasis are very possessive of Krishna. And they think, they don't want Krishna to even talk about Vrindavan. Because they feel that if he talks, he will remember. And if he remembers, then he will want to go. So, they just don't, so he has nobody with whom he can talk about Vrindavan. And nobody understands him also. So, but Uddhava alone understands him to some extent. And then he gives him a message to offer to the, especially the gopis. And when Uddhava goes to Vrindavan, Initially, he is thinking, okay, these people must be very special for Krishna, that, that Krishna is sending a message for them. 
but then he uh, when he actually goes there and he sees the extraordinary devotion of the brajwasis for krishna especially the gopis for krishna then he stunned <clears throat> now generally whenever we do any service it is if we are able to do that service well it is easy to become proud of our service i have done this service i have got this success but we as long as we stay in our shell we think that i am doing very big things but then we go out and look in the big world uh, if, you, if you travel across the world or just meet devotees across the world you start realizing that whatever you are doing however well there is somebody who is doing that better than you <laughs> and that creates some humility so in mathura uddhava was thinking that yes my devotion is very deep and i am so intimate with krishna but then he realized that the intimacy that the brajwasis had with krishna was unparalleled and he was nowhere near that on seeing that he was so stunned he console he tried to console the gopis he spoke about krishna he reminded them of krishna but while he was reminding them of krishna also he realized that actually they were much more absorbed in krishna than he was absorbed in krishna and it's uh, sometimes it happens say we give a class and some devotee comes this class was ecstatic and then i think i didn't feel any ecstasy in the class i only felt anxiety while giving the class <laughs> so as all the uddhava is speaking to the gopis but he is amazed to see the level of advancement of the gopis and then he has this longing that i want to experience a glimpse at least a glimpse of the extraordinary devotion of the gopis and he desires he prays for that fervently now we often pray but our prayers can turn out to be quite dangerous <laughs> so now he wants to experience the glimpse of the devotion of the vajwasis for krishna and krishna orchestrates situations in an extraordinary mystifying and agonizing way for that to happen in a in an almost inconceivable way all the dwarka vasis <laughs> Killed. Are they not killed? They kill each other. And then Krishna and Balaram also depart. And among all the Mathura Vasis, or Dwarka, who now become Dwarka Vasis, the only survivor is Uddhava. And then Krishna is speaking this Uddhav Gita to him elaborately. And after speaking that, he tells, "Now you go to the sages." and go to the sages of the himalayas and speak what i have spoken so now why krishna had the yadus disappear like this is very complex there are multiple reasons for this uh, our acharya has explained it elaborately one reason is ultimately that you know, however good life may be in this world death is never pleasant i write on the bhagavad gita every day on a website geeta daily so recently i wrote an article even if we fare well in life we still have to say farewell to life <laughs> even if we fare well in life everything goes wonderfully but we have to say farewell we have to give up everything so the bhagavatam doesn't flinch from the harsh realities of life so even when krishna is there in this world the harshness of the world may be temporarily subsiding because of him but ultimately it comes back so there are multiple reasons but in our context what is krishna doing krishna is giving uddhava an opportunity to experience love in separation similar to what he has seen the gopis experience in separation from him that's why i said our prayers can be sometimes be dangerous so now 
when something terrible happens in our life now we need some context to make sense of it what is happening and the bhagavatam essentially the purpose of the bhagavatam is to give us a fresher framework to look at things so everybody is lost uddhava has lost everyone he was devoted to the lord the lord is gone all his friends and other uh, family members with that they are all gone he is utterly alone at that time krishna speaks the uddhava gita to him and tells him to go so the uddhava gita gives him a philosophical and devotional vision by which he can process what has happened and he can appreciate that this is an opportunity for him to remember the lord and his understanding is revealed in this prayer these are practically the last words that uddhava speaks the elaborate uddhava gita is over after this now he is speaking this krishna will speak a couple of verses and then the uddhava gita will end so what is he saying over here namo astute mahayogi i offer my obeisances to you so great yogi the yogis perform miracles krishna has performed many many miraculous past times generally we see in the conclusion of wherever there is intimate description of krishna towards the end there is a opulent description of krishna also to remind us that this is not just an ordinary person hmm? uh, in the bhagavad gita also towards the end yatra yogeshwara krishna is a lord of all mystic powers so namo astute maha yogim prapannam anushadhimam i surrender to you and you please instruct me what do I, what instruction does he want he said that you have already got so much instruction but we specifically ask him that you please guide me from within my heart he knows that the oral the gita is instruction is ended but now he, this is a prayer more for assimilation and application yathatvacharanambhoje i want that instruction by which ma unto your lotus feet ratisyad anapai my attraction towards you will flow ceaselessly towards your lotus feet this is the ultimate asset that any of us can have in our spiritual lives and that this is for the gopis when when they got separated from krishna their attraction to krishna increased more and more so similarly he is praying and now i am going to get separated from you but please let my attraction to you increase more and more so separation does to love what wind does to fire i was in california a few months ago and there was there are horrible forest fires over there there is a <clears throat> there was a town or a nice resort town called paradise so the whole of paradise turned into hell practically because everything burnt and there's a devotee who's a forest fire he's a fire firefighter over there so he was telling that actually when these huge fires come up then the worst thing that can happen to them is winds come over there Uh, if the winds come the fire spreads so unpredictably and these are giant fires now often we from india uh, indians have a very romanticized idea of america in some ways of course comforts are more but there are lots of other issues that are there so these forest fires are so these are so uh, savage when they come up it can do nothing so when the forest fires come they are blowing blowing and everything can get consumed so the example is that separation is to is love as wind is to fire that means when a devotee is separated from the lord that fans devotion and then the devotion increases more and more and more however there is one important caveat in this one important qualification and warning what is that this this works only if the fire is like a forest fire if the fire is like a candle fire <laughs> and then wind comes <laughs> it will just get, get extinguished so if we think i will get separated from devotees 
and it will increase my separation and my appreciation for devotees. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we all need association. Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha. Our desires develop in association. So, for the gopis, their love for Krishna was so great that they could think of nothing except Krishna. And when they were separated from Krishna, that love increased more and more. And similarly for Uddhav, also, his love for Krishna increased more and more. So that was Krishna's plan and Uddhav is appreciating Krishna's plan. And appreciating Krishna's plan, now he is praying that, please let me play my part in your plan. <coughs> God's plan is going to work in everyone's life. But you know, for it to work in our life, we also have to work. Otherwise, the Lord's plan will work in spite of us. It will work around us, but we will be left out of it. So for the Lord's plan to work, we also need to work. And for us to work means we need the strength for that. We need the wisdom for that. So here he is praying, my dear Lord, please give me that attraction to you. So this is Uddhava's significance that this love and separation is being demonstrated, which is a summit of devotion that the gopis are experiencing, gopis are exhibiting and which Uddhava has witnessed. Now Uddhava is getting a glimpse of that. And that's how Krishna is fulfilling the desire of Uddhava. And Krishna is, now Uddhava is much more analytical and intellectual. So for some people, and there are different, we all have different psychologies. For some people, emotions follow thoughts. For some people, thoughts follow emotions. Then some people, first they feel and then they think. For some people, they think first and then they feel. Now, uh, for the gopis, they just have spontaneous love for Krishna. So just the thought of, just the remembrance of Krishna triggers great emotions. Our Uddhava, he is much more analytical. So Krishna has given him elaborate analytical description of various philosophical thoughts all culminating in bhakti and finally he is telling him now you can now he has got, got that foundation <coughs> with that foundation then the takeoff can happen so a transcendental journey of the heart toward krishna that is what is ultimately required and different people may need different support systems for that for some people, they just come into a very devotional atmosphere and they feel uplifted by that. For some people, they hear a lot of classes and then they feel uplifted by that. We all are all we are in a plane and we are riding this plane, we are driving this plane, which is meant to take off toward Krishna. So we have to and we have to find out what ensures that our plane takes off. And different planes are of different natures. Right? They have different mechanisms and different ways they fly. I was in Cincinnati, there's a devotee who is one of the big uh, design engineers for Boeing. So he took me to his, uh, uh, the plant where all these planes are manufactured. So actually different planes, if you use the takeoff mechanism of one plane for another plane, the plane will be grounded forever. Each plane has its own takeoff mechanism. So similarly for us, for us to take off for Krishna, we have to find out what is the takeoff mechanism that works for us. Otherwise, we might just go through the motions of bhakti, but we may not go through to the emotions of bhakti. We don't just want to go through the motions. We want to go through to the emotions. So it's our responsibility to find out what will get us to take off. So well, Krishna recognizes that Uddhava needs a philosophical boost. And that's what he is provided in through the Uddhava Gita. And then he is taking off in his devotion. So this is the first part that the significance of Uddhava in, the, in, in, in Krishna Lila primarily. The second part is significance of Uddhava in the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam is an extraordinary book because there's one Western commentator in the Bhagavatam says, I have never seen any book which is as obsessed with death as is the Bhagavatam. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that is true. 
uh, at one level because serious philosophy begins with an encounter with death a philosophy can just be like a, something for intellectual entertainment uh, or simulation that will find but when we encounter death at close quarters that's when we really think of oh, what is it that matters philosophy literally means philly and so forth philly is love and so forth is truth so philosophy is basically love of truth now there are many truths in life that we have some bank balance we have some strength we have some looks we have some positions and possessions all these are truths but they are truths which don't last for very long <coughs> So then, what is it that really lasts? What is it that really matters? So, to understand that, we need to understand what doesn't matter, or what won't matter eventually. And death is what reveals to us what doesn't matter. And that's why it jolts our attention and makes us look elsewhere. So, the Bhagavatam begins with this theme of Shukde, of Parikshit Maharaj about to die in seven days. And Shukdev Goswami giving him absorption in Krishna through sound vibration. But if we consider there are two, there is death and there is separation. And death and separation are in many ways similar. Because when we talk about separation, that means everything that is dear to us is taken away from us. That's when we feel separation. If we don't like someone and that person goes away, then we don't really feel separation from that person. We feel relief. Say goodbye and good riddance. Isn't it? So when there is, when we are deeply attached to something and we lose that, that's when we feel separation. And especially if something is something is we are very strongly emotionally invested in that, and then we lose it, it's agonizing. So separation is like a death. When Krishna says, Sambhavita Sacha Kirtir Maranadati In 134, when he's saying that for those who have been honored, dishonor is worse than death. What does he meaning by that? That that separation from honor is worse than death. Dishonor is essentially separation from honor. For somebody who has wealth and they lose that wealth, that separation from wealth is unbearable. So each of us may have certain things we are attached to. So, so death and separation are similar themes. And if we see in the Bhagavatam, this mood of separation is throughout the Bhagavatam. In fact, the sages who have assembled in Namisharanya, they are all, in a sense, experiencing separation. Because Krishna had just been there on that planet and then he has departed. So the whole of Bhagavatam is spoken in the shadow of separation from Krishna. In the shadow of separation from Krishna. It's like say if somebody has lived through the Indian independence struggle. And now most of that generation is quite old or is dead. But then for them, it was a traumatic event. It's ingrained in their memory. So for the next 10, 20, 30 years, that, that is the prominent event. The independence, the separation, the trauma, the elation, everything. So people live in the shadow of that. If, uh, <clears throat> any, any, in various countries, there are different events which, which cast a long shadow after that event also. So the Bhagavatam is spoken in the shadow of the separation from Krishna. In fact, the whole purpose of the Bhagavatam is what? That Puranarka Adunoditaha Kalau Nashtra Dushamesha That Krishna Swadhamo Pagati That when Krishna has departed from this world and everything is dark, the Bhagavatam is going to deal with that darkness by giving light. So now, this light is not just the light of philosophical knowledge. Actually, it is a light of devotional emotion. It is a light of how the attraction toward Krishna and absorption in Krishna can be maintained even in separation from him. And we see this theme of separation repeatedly right from the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam itself. The 
Krishna appears in the seventh chapter of the first canto, and eighth chapter immediately is Kunti spreads, and Kunti is about to experience separation from Krishna. And that first major prayer in the Bhagavatam concludes with something similar to this prayer. Toi me ananya vishaya matir madhupate sakrid pratimudvahta dadha gange vaugam udanvati. So rati syar anapaini. That just as my let my attachment flow towards you, just like she is saying, let my attraction flow towards you as the Ganga is flowing towards the ocean. So now the example of Ganga flowing towards the ocean has two meanings to it. When a Ganga is flowing towards the ocean, nothing holds the Ganga back and the Ganga holds nothing back. No matter what obstacle comes, somehow or other it keeps moving. And the Ganga doesn't think, you know, okay, I'll let 90% of my water flow, 10% I'll keep with me as a backup plan. No. So at one level you could say pure devotion means there is no plan B. Yes, we completely offer ourselves to Krishna. Of course, within the offering of ourselves to Krishna, there can be plan A, plan B, plan C. Prabhupada was very resourceful. Okay, if this didn't work out, I'll try this. If this didn't work out, I'll try this. But Prabhupada had no plan apart from the plan of serving Krishna. How to serve Krishna? That will vary from person to person, from situation to situation. But here, that teach comes in the first canto. Then again, after that, it comes in the Eighth chapter it comes in the ninth chapter. And the ninth chapter is what? Bhishma's separation. Bhishma's separation is not just that Krishna is going away from him, but he is going away. Separation can happen both ways. The Lord can go away from us or we can go away from the Lord. So he, he is on his deathbed and he is going to depart from the world. And there also he offers beautiful prayers and his mood essentially is, My dear Lord, I want, I want to be, uh, let me be absorbed in you. Then Tamima Mahajam Shari Rabhajam. My dear Lord, you are unborn, you have appeared in this world. Please let me be absorbed in you. And then, so, so the overall Srimad Bhagavatam is about how when, there, when we are separated from something which is of great value to us, we turn toward the Lord. So, Bhishma is going to lose his life. But his prayer is not that my life come back, that my attraction toward the Lord remains. And similarly, throughout the Bhagavatam, there are souls who experience separation from something of great value. Dhruva experiences separation from the affection of his father. And it's not just a small, it is not a, just a small separation, it's an utter rejection that he experiences. And still he stays focused. Instead, he gets absorbed in the Lord by the guidance of Narad Muni. The sixth canto we have, Chitra Ketu, he's, he's a devotee and he's a respectable person. But in one moment, he loses a respectable position and becomes a demon. It's, it's very difficult for us to even conceive of what he could have gone through at that time. It's almost like, suppose somebody is in a very respectable position in a devotee community and then suddenly some rumors start and gossip starts and then that person can't even show their face in the devotee community. Now gossip, gossip is terrible, it's like prajalba, you know, you know when gossip happens? Gossip happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> oh really he's like that oh okay when we hear something we like about someone we don't like then immediately gossip starts off and sometimes this gossip can become so so widespread so malicious that nowadays with internet available that before a person can respond to a gossip the gossip has gone all over the world it's some people think that their sole devotional service is spreading gossip. And it's like their full-time service they think it is. So what happens? You can be completely isolated. You can't even show your face in the devotee community. So Vritrasuru, so when he became like that, it's complete rejection for Chitragadu Vritrasuru. He lost everything. 
similarly prahlad is a small boy and for a child nothing is more important than the love of the parents and to suddenly lose that it is so difficult it's extremely difficult one thing one thing is to have a absent parent that's quite common in the western world most many children one out of two children almost one of two or three children are raised in single parent families so but it is one thing to have an absent parent but it is quite another to have an abusive parent and even an abusive parent is not as bad as a murderous parent so he had a father who was out to murder him. and then also so there are many things which are important for us in life and when they are taken away from us it's unbearable but the bhagavatam shows how when such things happen how the great devotees take shelter of the lord one of the oldest philosophical questions is this is i'm mixing the second and third part of the class how the devotion devotion is relevant to us one of the oldest philosophical questions is why do bad things happen to good people i was in canada and one boy came to me a 6 year old boy and he asked me why do bad things happen to good people and normally when somebody asks this question at a personal level you, know, you want to know what's going on where are they coming from so i asked him what happened this today morning i was taking my with milk with my biscuit but my biscuit fell into the milk <laughs> <laughs> so for him that is a bad thing happening to a good person <laughs> so different people have different ideas of what is bad thing happening to good people but this happens to everyone so the bhagavatam actually doesn't go much into philosophy of karma in fact in fact as far as i have read the ramayana mahabharat bhagavatam anywhere and nowhere have i seen somebody who is suffering and somebody else comes and tells them you are suffering because of your karma that is very insensitive it is inappropriate nobody tells them. like that it is more, our purpose is to assist and comfort people when they are in distress when abhiman news killed krishna doesn't tell it is abhiman news karma or your karma to arjuna anyway what the bhagavatam does is rather than giving a philosophical explanation of the problem of evil of why do bad things happen to good people the bhagavatam shifts so instead what does it do it demonstrates when bad things happen to good people what do good people do that is the thrust of the bhagavatam and all these people terrible things are happening to them but throughout what are they doing they taking shelter of the lord eighth canto is where bali maharaj gives up everything he gives up his kingdom in charity and what does he get he gets arrested for that he gets scorned and cursed by his guru for that but he stays devoted and the same narrative it attains its culmination in in the in the predicament of the gopis where the gopis they give up everything for the lord and then the lord gives them up now when distress comes from where the distress is coming determines how much it is bearable or unbearable so there's a difference between tragedy and evil tragedy is when something bad happens to us say you now we are driving a car and suddenly the car's wheel gets punctured and our car crashes and we meet an accident and get fractured or something like that that's a tragedy but say we are driving a car and somebody comes in a truck deliberately destroy our car and so they are deliberately out to destroy someone that is not just tragedy that is evil evil means to cause suffering for the sake of causing suffering that a simpler level we are going through a crowded area and say somebody somebody is walking by this they they put their foot on our foot it's painful now that is a minor version it's painful it's, you could say it's a minor version of a tragedy but suppose somebody sees that they have put a foot on our foot and they see it and then they deliberately raise their foot and bang it down <laughs> that tragedy you could say it like accident evil is malicious it's intentional so when suffering is being intentionally inflicted by someone upon us it becomes even more difficult to bear 
Now for the gopis, it is Krishna who leaves them and goes away. First in the Ras Leela and then later on when he goes to Uddhava. So at that time, to maintain devotion to Krishna, how does one do that? When the person to whom we are devoted, that person is the cause of our suffering. How do we stay devoted at that time? That is the magnitude of the devotion of the gopis for Krishna. And same principle is again Uddhava. Uddhava is also going to experience, experience great agony. But the solution to agony is absorption. Increase absorption in Krishna. And that's the theme of the Bhagavatam. In Uddhava is demonstrating the same lesson that Parikshit also has to learn. Generally, whenever something bad happens to us, the mind makes us believe that nobody is having problems as big as you have. Nobody is suffering as much as you are suffering. And the mind gets us alone and then it gets us. So, now we see Parikshit, for him at least, okay, he had made a small mistake and he got a big problem because of that. He was cursed to die in seven days. But if you look at all the stories in the Bhagavatam, most of these characters have done nothing wrong. We could say, Dhru, nothing, that's a normal parent, desire of a child for a parent's affection. Prahalad, he was just being a devotee. Bali Maharaj, he was actually being a charitable person. The gopis, they were ready to give up everything for Krishna. And they had to suffer the agony of separation. So what the Bhagavatam through its stories is telling that, Oh Parikshet, you, are suff- you, are, you alone are not suffering. Others have suffered much, much more. Don't focus on life's unfairness. Focus on Krishna's mercifulness. Focus not on why life is so unfair to you. Focus on how you are getting opportunities to serve Krishna, to remember Krishna, to become absorbed in Krishna. And then, similarly, Uddhava is the last story where at least Shukdev Goswami is surrounded and Parishadha is surrounded by so many other people who are all going to speak to him. But Uddhava, everybody has left him. No, he's alone and he has to go through this a long distance to the sages. And later on he described Uddhava is so traumatized. He walks and he falls and stumbles and he cries and he's blinded. And somehow he makes his way to the Himalayas. Somehow he reaches. So Parikshit Maharaj is being assured that don't, don't, the English word is hyperventilate. Hyperventilate means react in emotionally extreme ways. Yes, life is painful, but life is painful for everyone. Don't hyperventilate about it. And that is a lesson which okay, apply for all of us. Uddhava is going to lose everything, but he is being given the resources to absorb himself in Krishna. And for all of us, in our lives, we have, we have many desires. Even the desires to serve Krishna are there. I want to do this for Krishna, I want to do that for Krishna. And it's wonderful. Every spiritual desire is an asset for us in our spiritual journey. Because if that spiritual desire fills our heart, then material desires will go out of our heart. But even our desires for what is desired for Krishna should not be desired more than Krishna. What is desired for Krishna? If we are doing some preaching program and we want a lot of people to come for that program. But we shouldn't get so caught in desiring that and if that is not happening, we get, we get agitated, we get frustrated. And then what is desired for Krishna, if, we, if it, that is desired more than Krishna, then that can also become a distraction from Krishna. Our strongest desire has to be for Krishna. Of course, for most of us, that desire for Krishna will develop by desiring something for Krishna. It's very little, it's not so easy to have a desire directly for Krishna. I just have Bhagavatam, I want to absorb myself in Bhagavatam. Well, it's good if we can, but we decide, let me study the Bhagavatam, let me share the Bhagavatam. And for sharing the Bhagavatam, let me savor the Bhagavatam. Let me appreciate it, relish it, and then I can share it. So, if we understand that our ultimate purpose is absorption in Krishna, then no matter what happens, what is given to us or what is taken away from us, 
that won't disturb us so much because we will have Krishna always with us. And that is the prayer that Uddhava is offering here at the conclusion of the Uddhava Gita and that is a prayer that we all can offer to Krishna in, our, in the practice of our bhakti. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke broadly on this theme of how uh, what significance of Uddhava in the in the tenth in the in Krishna Lila in the Bhagavatam and in our bhakti life. So in the tenth canto, Uddhava is an intimate associate of Krishna who acts like a connector between Mathura Dwarka and Vrindavan. And that same exalted love in separation that he has observed and appreciated in the gopi, appreciated in the gopis, Krishna is giving Uddhava an opportunity to experience that when he is separated from all the Dwarkavasis and from Krishna also. So, separation does to love what wind does to fire. It expands when the fire is already big. It extinguishes when the fire is small. Uddhava's fire of devotion is large. Separation is going to enlarge it further. And Uddhava is an analytical intellectual person. So, different planes require different things for takeoff. So, Krishna has given him elaborate philosophy so that he can take off on his devotional journey and we also need to find out what we need for take off in our spiritual journey and we acquire those resources for us. In the overall picture of the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam essentially is describing the mood of death and separation and when something of great value is taken away from us, then how do we deal with it? Parikshit is going to lose his life. Rishit Maharaj and similarly there are great devotees we discuss who lose things that are very dear to them and in all those situations the devotees turn and become absorbed in the Lord rather than addressing the question why do bad things happen to good people at a philosophical level the Bhagavatam focuses on the question what do good people do when bad things happen to them and in our spiritual lives when we are practicing bhakti we are doing, our ultimate purpose is absorption in Krishna and we may desire to do many things for Krishna and that every spiritual desire is an asset, it's a treasure. But what is desired for Krishna shouldn't be desired more than Krishna. A foremost desire, if we keep it absorption in Krishna, then what we, what is given to us, what is taken away from us, neither of those will distract us from Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? I don't think there's any straightforward way to know that. Basically, it's not that I have a whole class on this topic of digital and analog conceptions of bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is, it's not that it's, that it's sincere or insincere. It's more like there are different levels of sincerity in our practice of bhakti. So it's not necessarily like zero one. There are levels. If we consider 12, 8 to 12, 12, Krishna is talking, okay, be spontaneously absorbed in me. If not spontaneously absorbed, then be conscientiously absorbed in me. If you can't be conscientiously absorbed, then serve me. If you can't serve me, then work for me. Work and give your fruits to me. If you can't do that, then work and give your fruits to some good cause. At least get out of yourself. Get out of self-obsession. So Krishna is giving various levels by which you can gradually reach to him. So, rather than thinking about are we sincere or are we not sincere, we can focus on what is in our hands to do and try to do that as much as we can. So, if we just, um, if we just observe ourselves and think, okay, we can easily say we list down three things that we can do better than what we are doing. There can be infinite. But you can just list down three things which are doable and just you know make a specific prayer that this is how I want to connect with you, I want to do this. Please help me to do this and please give me the strength to do this and start doing it. So it is, there is the, there is the internal 
prayer, remembrance of Krishna, there is external action. So now, uh, how genuine, how sincere, how pure the emotion is. You know, there is no, like, if you have, uh, if you have to drink water, you can maybe get a meter to check how pure the water is. But you can't put a meter inside the heart to check how pure our heart is. But what we can see is how our actions are. And you could say, oh, there are so many, so many things I am doing right, so many things I am doing wrong. But okay, this is something which is, or oh, I can get it this much here. So if our actions overall are going in the right direction and we are trying to get them in the right direction, when they go off also, we try to get them back. So it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult at our level to look at sincerity as a, as some as a virtue that we can evaluate in our hearts we can look at our actions and try to make our actions more sincere if we do that then gradually sincerity will be cultivated and another thing we can do is that we can also look at when non devotional or anti devotional emotions come up within us and they will come up inevitably but when they come up what do we do do we welcome them or do we try to avoid them? Do we do we uh, do we do we try to pray? Let this go away. Krishna sees not just our feelings; he sees also our feelings about our feelings. Sometimes I just I just don't feel like chanting. I don't feel like reading Bhagavad. I don't feel like coming in the association of devotees. Okay, you know that's just the mind is. Uh, Mind is a machine of its own. The mind works according to the modes. So certain feelings like that will come. But when those feelings come, how do we view them? <sighs> okay, now I got this excuse, I will not go. Or no, I'm going to, I, I don't want these feelings. I want to feel connected with you, Krishna. I want to feel devotional. So if, if we try to maintain it that way, so then we can say that also is an indicator of our sincerity. So just the presence of non-devotional feelings doesn't mean lack of sincerity. Or just the presence of devotional feelings doesn't mean the presence of sincerity. Because the feelings will keep changing. It's more that our overall attitude, our overall purpose and our overall actions. That's the best way to understand. Okay. Thank you. Hare but uh, if we try, uh, if we uh, analyze uh, in the in the case of our devotees who are very sincere, very sincere, they are performing devotional service very sincerely, but they are taken out uh, from the association of devotees by the because of their critical situation in their home or whatever. So how we can is it separation uh, happened by the mercy of Lord or is it and after that they lose the in uh, devotion also they cannot perform devotion. Later. Okay, yeah. So, how to match this statement? Yeah. So, if somebody is, say, because of their family situation or something like that, has to go from association of devotees and they lose their taste in the bhakti. So, in that case, what has separation done? Well, I also said the other possibility that separation can be like, a, that our, if our love is like a candle, then separation, the wind of separation can extinguish it. So, now we don't want to say that specifically to some devotee directly. But we all need some kind of support system so that we can continue practicing bhakti. And uh, there is a, there's a positive side and there's a negative side. That when there is association, then just the force of association helps us to get, keep moving along with the flow. Mm -hmm. That everybody is doing, let me also do it. Now that's good, but how much of it is is coming from our heart and how much is of it is coming from the desire to look good in the association of devotees? That is something that is not so easy to know. So just because somebody is doing devotional service very nicely in the external sense, doesn't necessarily mean that their heart is automatically getting purified. So sometimes some people when they go away from bhakti or go away from the association of devotees, then that is a time they may be reevaluating their priorities and they may feel okay you know this is a level i can't practice at this level now we don't have to necessarily think that they have gone into maya we have to see that maybe 
they have to find out a way at which they can practice sustainably. And if it's a lower level of seriousness, that's okay. And but they have got some taste of Krishna Bhakti and they will rise to a higher level. So we all our attitude needs to always be at one level, we want to protect our devotion, but at the same time, we also want to protect other protect ourselves from becoming judgmental towards others. So what is going on between them and Krishna, we do not know. And yes, if we have some kind of support system that can be provided wherever devotees go, then that is good. So that's why while we are in association, it's not just doing the activities of bhakti, but it's also maintaining the relationships, strengthening the relationship with each other. That's also important. So that even if somebody goes away, still they stay in touch with a particular devotee. And that way, if somebody is going through some difficulties, then they will not feel that, oh, I'll be judged and rejected. That if they, if they have that feeling, then they will not even seek shelter, seek some assistance, seek some guidance. So we need to be at one level less judgmental about those devotees who go away. At the same time, we also can see how some support system can be provided. It's, it's complicated. Some devotees go away from association and then they create their own association some other place. Some devotees go away from association and then they just seem to go away from devotion itself. So it's everybody at a particular level, everybody in a particular consciousness. So we can do the best that we can. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you I was thinking when we are doing service, uh, we face a lot of challenges. At times, we also face a lot of failures. Um, and with that intention that we would like to serve Krishna, Guru Maharaj, and all, we thought of that service and we were making attempts. We also see sometimes, you know, material people do not, with not much of depth. Just for the sake of it, they do it and they get a lot of success. Mm. Krishna does not choose to give us that at that time. So how do we understand that? Yeah. That's tough. Sometimes we are trying to serve Krishna but we don't get success. And sometimes something similar materialistic people do, even without much depth, they get a lot of success in that. Yeah. Mm. Broadly speaking, he now, who, okay, let me put it at two different levels. See, so there is, there are material principles that work in material nature. And there are spiritual principles that transcend material nature. So, what do I mean by this? That, There is, we are spiritual beings in physical bodies. Say, suppose somebody has got diabetes. And then they take maybe some pedhas or laddus. This is prasad, this is Krishna. How can I refuse this? They may take it, it's going to purify me. Yes, it will purify your soul. But it's going to agitate your body. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so. <laughs> So, just because we are devotees doesn't mean that Krishna is going to change the rules of the game for us. So, the rules of the game means there are certain material principles that work, material laws which work and things are going to work according to those laws. So, as devotees, now at the material level, we could say that when somebody is successful, there could be multiple causes. Something could be that they are just more talented. They have more contacts or you could say actually sometimes success depends not just on their talent, their dedication, their vision, it also depends on their past karma. Some people just have good karma from their past and that's how they succeed. Now as devotees, is it that when a devotee is very successful in their preaching, is it necessarily because of their purity? It could be that some devotees, just even before they became devotees, they just are charismatic people. And even they are devotees, they are charismatic. 
and they attract a lot of people. Others, they're not that charismatic. So now, if somebody is phenomenally successful as a preacher, now, uh, now is it because of their purity, which is coming from their bhakti, or is it, it is because of their charisma, which is coming from their past karma? It's very difficult to know this. Now, we should always respect all devotees. And if some devotees are successful, you can always respect them. And now, Bhakti Sanskritakura at one level said that a test, uh, <coughs> that a test of a Vaishnava is how many Vaishnavas that person makes. But then Prabhupada also said that if you're going to give, if you're going to sell gold, not many people are going to come. And he said that. Okay, that's why <coughs> other spiritual teachers, often they get many, many followers. Prabhupada also have got, got many, but still not as many as say some other, other spiritual teachers who are giving something much more uh, diluted. So, when we are striving to serve Krishna, we need to be very clear about what is our purpose. Our first purpose is that through the service, we connect with Krishna. That is our connection to Krishna. And second is, our contribution. This is what I want to contribute. Now, there is a reciprocation from Krishna or reciprocation from the world, whichever way you want to look at it. Now, that is not in our control. We see the Bhagavad Gita has two endings. One is where Krishna speaks to Arjuna and Arjuna says, Nashto Moha Sute Labdha. His Arjuna's confusion, illusion all dissipated. So, Krishna's delivery of the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna is successful. But then the second half, or sec, other part is Sanjay speaks the same message to Dhritarashtra. And Dhritarashtra's heart is not at all changed. Dhritarashtra still remains attached to Duryodhana. And the war goes on over there. So you could say at one level, Sanjay's delivery of the message to Dhritarashtra is unsuccessful. But that is the significance of the last five verses of the Bhagavad Gita. I've got a series of classes on those five verses, 74 to 78, where 76 and 77 he is describing Rishyami cha muhur muhur, Rishyami cha puna puna, Rajan samsmitya samsmitya, that as I'm remembering, O king, samvadam imam adbhutam, keshavarjuna yo punyam, as I'm remembering this message, and I'm remembering the Lord who delivered the message. That's the, <coughs> Tatya samsmatya samsmatya rupamatya adbhutam hare vismayo me mahan rajan vishyam chapuna puna. So he had that internal success, even if the external success was not there. So the internal success was his absorption in Krishna. So for all of us, when we are striving to do some service, yes, we, we all need to make some strategies, some plans, and do some assessment. Why am I not being successful? Can I do something better? But if we are doing our part and things are not clicking, then we shouldn't get too obsessed with that. Because sometimes factors beyond our endeavor and our planning are involved in getting that success. So some devotees might be very wonderful, very, very deep, very profound, very wonderful preachers, but they may never become very celebrated. Some other devotees, they just they seem to be very symbol, straightforward classes and they become immensely popular. Now, why the difference? We don't know really. If we can use our intelligence to understand and we can learn something from it, wonderful. But if we can't, then we do our service for our connection with Krishna. And why is Krishna not giving us those results? So that now in some places, Krishna may change a particular devotee's karma. Also, that some devotees by their past karma are meant to be popular and they become devotees and they become popular as devotees. Some people by their karma are not meant to be that popular. Even they become devotees, they don't become that popular. It's possible. So we don't have to, the purpose of devotion is neither popular, is not popularity. It is, it is purity, it is absorption in Krishna. So if we have that purpose clear, then we won't be so disturbed by it. Now, we see even Sri Prabhupada's life, for the first 35-40 years, there's almost no success. And then Krishna gave phenomenal success. 
But it is not that Prabhupada is doing the same thing again and again. Prabhu said, this is not working. He tried in India, it's not working. Try something else. He tried back to world magazine. He tried writing books. He tried working with his god brothers. He tried starting an institute, League of Devotees. This, this, this. He tried various things. And then eventually something clicked for him. So we need to, at one level, be resourceful in trying to analyze and understand how we can do our service better. But at the same time, while being resourceful in terms of the practical readjustment of our services so that they can become more effective, we also need to be internally renounced. That, okay, I am doing this ultimately for Krishna. And what Krishna wants more than the, than the offering of the result is the offering of our own heart. And what we are doing is for ultimately for offering our heart to Krishna. And many devotees ask me, how do we know what is our nature? Like if I am doing this service, is this according to my nature? Now there is, of course, we can have an elaborate class on this. But one simple way to know if something is according to our nature is, if nobody appreciates it, will you still want to do it? <laughs> now, now we, of course, we need human reciprocation. But the point is, there are some things which we just, yes, this is what I want to do. If I'm not going to do this, what am I going to do else? So if we can find some service like that, then the service itself will give us so much joy. Of course, if we get the results, we get the reciprocation from others, that is wonderful. But we shouldn't think that if we are not getting that, that doesn't mean our service is a failure necessarily. It could be that Krishna has some other plan. If we are getting, we are still connected, we are absorbed in Krishna, that's wonderful. Okay. So, we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Grantraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki. Tai Gaur Premanandi.